thinkers and activists and developers and strategists and scholars get together to compare notes, that simple gesture of, of, of collegiality between cities. We, we know it a little bit at the level of mayors, uh, we know it a little bit at the level of technical infrastructure, we know it at the level of uh, global consultancies and, and global, we, we know all those kinds of things. But in the end, I think almost all of those procedures that lead to a kind of consolidation of an already established understanding of what is best practices. And as you probably know, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation doesn't like best practices. <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're looking for bad practices, it's that the main mission is to try to identify what would be the conditions under which the new practices that will retroactively be regarded as best would be generated. In other words, how do you lead rather than you follow? And it's not like the school saying, we would like to lead. It's that the school would like to think, under which conditions would new forms of leadership be developed around the question of cities? To do this, we need our colleagues from, from our sister schools like Harvard. So, for example, I'm really so pleased that our colleagues from Harvard are here. This, this will have to be something done between universities in the same way that it's done uh, between cities. And it seems to me if you get together the kinds of people that play this sport together, you can actually have a genuine collegial discussion about uh, common issues and solutions. So to start again. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, so the main point here is just a very simple thing, that you got together to have a meal last night, which is the main purpose of the event. <laughs> Today is just legitimizing the fact that you already had a meal together, because of course if you eat together and talk together over food, then you're actually living together. One possible definition of a city is simply not, it's not a physical form, it's not a particular kind of infrastructure, it's simply how you share your, it's that which allows you to share your life with someone else. We tend to share our lives in cities, in fact cities are arguably the single best invention of the human species. Cities are a spectacular success, which means they are also spectacular sites of problems but mainly sets of opportunities, and for almost everybody in this room, problems are exactly that opportunity. So the understanding here is that is if you eat together, and spend a day together here sharing your ideas as new friends and colleagues, that new forms of intelligence will be born, new kinds of responsibilities for each of us in our own uh, lives and so on. So this is an extended way of saying thanks to, to Kay for having done an incredibly amazing thing. Of course, in theory, these cities have in common the question of the waterfront. And maybe you could reverse engineer that and say this is really uh, a conference of four waterfronts attached to which is something that may or, be, that may or may not be what we call a city. Some of the people that are in this room are the absolute experts about that thing, that urban formation which is attached to the waterfront. To, to the, to, to the waterfront. But as you know, cities are extraordinarily complex and mysterious and beautiful organisms. So I think a lot of what today will be is not so much people saying what have we done or what's in front of us, but just to kind of to develop a kind of feeling for this extraordinary organism that is developing around the waterfront. And also just to, to get a little bit of a feeling about what's in common uh, between these things. Not because we want to develop a single set of best practices that apply to all four cities, for example, or any city on the waterfront, but it's more the other way around. If, if, if I look at cities that are on the waterfront and I find the very best people in those cities and I do so with four cities and they talk together, that conversation may give me clues as to possible futures of cities in general. In other words, it's not simply about solving problems on the waterfront. It's the fact that the waterfront stimulates the city to think differently. Uh, cities like Istanbul, uh, like New York, like Mumbai, like Rio de Janeiro are actually kind of generated by the waterfront. So we could ask the question, if these cities were generated by the waterfront, the waterfront, the waterfront uh, because maybe that's what it is, the waterfront and the waterfront, the battlefield, and maybe this is what this conference is, you're coming in to give us notes from your respective battlefields, but imagine that these cities were produced by the waterfront, They're not cities with the waterfront, but they are waterfronts that then gave birth to a city. The question would be now, Given the complete transformation of the status of water, of waterfronts, of trade, of exchange, and of information, what possible kind of city would be born in the future out of waterfronts? And I think that's much more the point here. 
So it's a kind of retroactive look at what's been happening in your city. It's a, it's a look at the present, like what are you really doing right now? But much, much more is what kind of uh, trigger will fluidity and exchange produce in the future? What kind of clues about how to live together more beautifully will be coming out of your uh, cities? Each of you could probably compete on uh, like who's got the worst traffic, who's got the worst pollution, who's got the worst of everything. And I do believe that you would all win. You would all be the winners of having the most problems. But I think you will also win if you say, which of you has, has something going on that could incubate new thinking about the city? And by, by new thinking about cities, I wouldn't even really suppose that by city I mean you know, one, two, three, four, 28 million people. City of the future could be 10,000 people in a very particular form of organization that through new technologies of infrastructure of uh, electronic exchange and so on actually have the full capacity of what we currently associate with a dense city. Statistically, it's not looking that likely right now. Statistically, it looks as if 80% of the world will be living in cities by the year 2050. Uh, no one knows what that means. And you're all experts, and I've got to tell you, you don't know. Right? I have only one job, which is to know that you don't know. We, we probably know what it means to live on Mars. Almost all of you can come up with a kind of a description of what would be needed to urbanize Mars. And you would have very similar descriptions and very similar technology. We know much less about what it means to live on Earth than to live on Mars. And the city of the future, the city of, let's say, our grandchildren, is coming towards us faster than any meteor. Right? So I see this conference in that kind of mode. You're sitting here, you're looking at the waterfront, and rushing towards you at high speed, um, you know, there's 8 billion people uh, in something called a city, and you have a kind of responsibility to say what would be the mechanism by which those 8 billion people could live together. And I deeply, deeply believe that the answers lie in, 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 in water, have classically, famously always been in water. It seems to me whenever you're having some difficulty in your life, um, go to the water. I mean, don't jump in, it's not a good choice, um, you can't swim. But from the water, you will get the uh, lessons that you need. And just to say this very obviously, I think we are largely made of water ourselves. We are uh, kind of aquatic uh, uh, creatures. So in that sort of weirdly romantic light, I really think that this is, a, this is an opportunity for all of us as experts to look again at the water and see what it is that the water would offer us in terms of clues as to possible ways of living together. Then, if you have those clues, we can apply our various forms of expertise to really leverage those and turn those into business models, political models, social justice models, architectural models, artistic models, and so on. Anyway, this is an extended thank you to the wonderful Kate Asher, professor here at the school, and also to thank in particular the Durst family for really doing that very, very special thing, which is to support the most cutting edge capacity of the School of Architecture to think. And what we say is the only way we can think at the leading edge is to be together with the best minds from around the world. So to the Durf, I cannot, I just cannot say how grateful we are for having been the trigger. And I really, really hope that we return this generosity in excess by offering the trigger back to the business community and back to the city community. Okay, three or four times, thank you to Kate. So I'll try to have one thing in one hand, one thing in the other, but I might try to forward this and speak into this or something. Um, but anyway, all I'll say very quickly is that really everybody's here because of Mark, because when we started thinking about what the next Durst International Symposium would be, he said, you know, it'd be great if we could take some of the cities that we have our Studio X's in um, and pull them together. And he said, how about Istanbul? How about Rio? How about Mumbai? And of course, we're here in New York. And so I was really left trying to figure out what would be the right spine of that conference and of course landed very quickly on the waterfront as something that um, from a city development point of view these cities all had in common. So this is really Mark's brainchild. I hope I've ev executed it um, well enough but we'll find out by the end of the day today. So I'm um, going to very quickly um, touch on New York before I turn it over to the Studio X 
managers who are actually going to touch very quickly on their cities. And our idea in this half an hour, and it will only be half an hour, we hope, is really just to give you an overview of some of the things that have happened in these cities that sort of warrant a discussion of the new waterfront versus the old waterfront. Um, and then we'll actually get into the panels, which is the meat of it. For those of you from New York, I'm sorry you'll know this, but I think some of our foreign visitors may not. Um, New York is probably the most dramatic example of change, in part because change on the waterfront, and really the subject of the conference is really what happened to the waterfront once it wasn't working anymore. By working, we mean the commercial, the port, the maritime waterfront, which was, as Mark said, at the heart of the founding of each of these cities. And of course it was New York. New York was a Dutch trading colony. New York was all wharves and piers. And if you look on the left-hand picture, you can see there was hardly a street that didn't end in a wharf or a pier. And if you look on the right and you see the more modern iteration, you can see that most of those piers are long gone and replaced, in many cases, by landfill. Um, just so that you know, we remember how active the harbor once was, the, the drawing on the top left really shows just how many little boats there were in the harbor before we had, we actually had the Brooklyn Bridge in that picture. We didn't have yet other bridges and we certainly didn't have the tunnels at that time. So that was probably about um, 1885, something around there. But you can see the density of harbor traffic because of all the piers and the wharves. You can also see the streets adjacent to the waterfront and how how fabulously busy they were with trucking and commerce and markets and you know longshoremen and all sorts of things that really populated those uh, budding streets. Um, just to give you an idea, a big map view, if you look at the areas in red, you see where the heart of New York's old port was. There were many other port facilities. There still are in other places. They're much smaller. But much of the port was, was around the sort of lower half if you will, of Manhattan. The upper half is, it has cliffs and has other reasons why you wouldn't dock ships there. And of course, along the waterfront, in, primarily in Brooklyn. And again, there's deep water there, and there are all kinds of facilities um, to allow ships to, to, to land. If you look at the yellow, that is really where the heart of the container port is, which is, for all intents and purposes, our port facilities today. You can see that it's in New Jersey. If you don't know your geography, that is a different state. And it's right, it's right adjacent to Newark Airport. So if you've flown in and out of Newark Airport and you look down um, to the east as you're landing, um, you'll see giant container cranes, and that is a huge container port that spans the cities of Newark and Elizabeth, and there's an additional large facility in Bayonne. What's not shown here is actually there's a terminal on the north edge of Staten Island, which should be shown in yellow as well, which is also a big container terminal. Um, the reason these facilities are in New Jersey as opposed to in New York is if you look down on the left, you can see, the, the bottom left, you can see what Port Newark looked like. It was a huge swamp. There was nothing there in 1956 when Malcolm McLean invented the container. Nothing. And this, this port, ironically, was one of the first to embrace containerization. It took a bet on Malcolm, who sailed the first container ship, and it built the container port very, very early when nobody was sure that container technology was going to take off. So in some senses, it was the sort of engine of its own downfall because it embraced containerization so early. Once it did, there really was no place to put a container ship on the old docks and ports, the finger piers that ringed Manhattan. And so essentially the port died in Brooklyn and Manhattan very, very early and very quickly. And of course, I don't need to tell you what, how containerization took off. Um, that's the primary way that most freight moves around this world. New York is still a very, very big port. It's not the biggest in the world. It's not even the biggest in the country. That's Los Angeles and Long Beach. But it is still a huge container port. And we've all, you know, We've all benefited tremendously from containerization. It essentially has underpinned the global economy. But in doing so, um, it's also left an awful lot of our waterfront facilities derelict, decrepit, and without any sense of purpose. And really, the focus of this conference is to think about how have we in the past and how will we in the future repurpose these once working waterfronts so that they work for people, they work for recreation, they work for coastal resilience, they work in all sorts of ways that historically were not the ways they needed to work. So just to give you an idea, because what I'm hoping each of the Studio X folks will do is give you an idea where the locations of some of the projects are. Um, 
We'll come back to this in a later panel, but I wanted you to see where some of the parks that today exist. Um, you can ignore the colors for right now, but you can see that this is largely where these old park facilities are. These are, these are our foremost um, waterfront park developments. And when I say developments, in some of them, there is housing adjacent to the park. In one of them, there is housing in the park, and we'll be hearing about that later. But primarily, these are recreational spaces for the people. And just to give you a flavor of what some of them look like, I know those of you who are not from New York hopefully will have a chance to visit some of these in the next few days. Regina, who runs Brooklyn Bridge Park, will be um, doing a, a walk tomorrow morning at 10, and I know some of the panelists will be joining her. We'll hear more about Hudson River Park, Battery Park City at the top. And if you focus on the top left, just have a look at the top sort of black and white photo. That's how many finger piers where, where Battery Park City is today. And of course, if you look at Battery Park City today, it was built on the fill from the World Trade Center, is now a thriving community with essentially an extension of the street grid that connects it right into the city. So it's almost seamless. It feels very much like a part of the city. Okay. And again, not necessarily that our model is the right model. We've had some successes. They've been very, very long and hard in coming. And we'll talk today about a lot of the challenges that have faced us in transforming our working waterfront into a place that is really, um, I would say, one of the great assets of the city today, which are these waterfront parks, which previously didn't exist. The same goes for London, and we won't go through this. The same goes for Barcelona that's transformed its waterfront. The same goes for parts of San Francisco. That's actually the ferry terminal at the bottom. And these are places that have had to deal with the impact of container and of the port essentially moving to backwaters with much more upland area than the piers ever had. And I'm just going to give you a quick picture again of the cities. We'll go through this in Mumbai. The waterfront is a fascinating subject, both east and west side of Mumbai, and we'll hear about that. In Rio de Janeiro, there's a huge project underway that we'll hear a lot about, which is actually transforming um, a part of the city that's along the water that's adjacent to the heart of the city and turning it really into a, a sort of city of tomorrow. And in Istanbul, which is, of course, one of the world's treasured waterfront cities, there's multiple developments underway that we'll hear about in different parts of Istanbul that are really the successor to some early interventions in waterfront parks that the city made. So that's really all I really want to say by way of introducing our Studio X directors who are going to give you hopefully a very short overview of their cities and then we'll move into the first panel. I'm not sure who's first. Um, Rajiv, I think we'll, we'll start with... Oh, sorry, we're going to start with Istanbul and I'll let Selva introduce herself. Thank you. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, let's find the slides first. Yeah, it is starting with Mumbai. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, so um, I've been asked to provide you with a brief introduction uh, to Mumbai and possibly some of the key issues which affect the existing and potential strategies for understanding the nature of uh, waterfront development in the city. Uh, this is by no means a simple task, and I don't expect to uh, accomplish anything in 10 minutes. Uh, but um, in a complex and contemporary Mumbai, we can hopefully, uh, through outlining a series of historical events, uh, try to set at least a minimal foundation for the discussions which we will um, uh, have today. My presentation is entitled Bombay Recycled, and it starts out with this image uh, that I use actually quite often. It was generated during a workshop at Studio X in 2011. And it was done uh, as a very simple pencil drawing on vellum by a commercial artist in Dharavi, which is, as everyone must know, the, the uh, largest, uh, technically the largest slum in um, Asia. The drawing, for me, uh, represents a very interesting uh, idea. It basically, for me, it negotiates two different worlds. One is the kind of traditional, the kind of the craft, um, the, the conventional ideas that exist, kind of a lot of uh, um, artisans and uh, people in Mumbai. And the second is this kind of diagram that you see in the center, which is a more modern or contemporary image, which then the artist decided to incorporate um, within one drawing. Now, 
for me, it's not just the drawing, it's really an image of the city. Um, and what I would like to do today, it, it, uh, in, in terms of Mumbai, is trying to develop the current situation and try to uh, understand the precipice that we are, uh, in a way, um, standing in, a unique junction in which will define the history of what is to come of the waterfronts. So briefly, in a, in a history, um, Mumbai, or Bombay, whichever one uh, chooses to call it, has always been symbiotically connected to its waterfronts. As you may know, originally a, co <coughs> a collection of seven islands, Kalaba, Mazgao, Mahim, Perel, Bombay Island, Worli, and um, Old Woman's Island, which are indicated on the, with the red dots on the map on the right, um, these were originally inhabited by the Kolis, or fishing communities. They were also ruled over the centuries by different various kingdoms and, and countries. Mumbai's primary allure was always that of its geographically strategic location on the western coast of India. So in trying to understand the condition of the waterfront, I wanted to familiarize you with the three, um, three historically pertinent events of the last 150 years or so, which I feel have had a great influence on the current state of Mumbai and in relation to its waterfronts. The first um, is, was called the Hornby Villard uh, Infrastructure Project, which was started in 1845, uh, completed in 1845. It was initiated by the governor, William Hornby, at the time, and was a large-scale infrastructural project connecting the seven independent islands of Mumbai, basically through reclamation and fill. It was a tremendous accomplishment as if it not only achieved its primary goal to create embankments, which protected um, the low-lying areas of Mumbai, especially in areas of mid Worli and the middle. Um, I don't know if this, this doesn't work on this, but can you, see? Yeah, you, can't, see, you can't see it. Um, which not only created these kind of embankments which protected the low-lying areas, but it also set the stage for the completion of the most efficient urban transport um, system in Mumbai, which are the suburban railways which were first connected um, in 1853, shortly after the project was done. It was no coincidence that the first cotton textile mill was also um, uh, created in Mumbai in 1854, initiating the beginnings of massive industry which had um, its core in the city itself, and as we know through current controversy of the last seven, eight years, the textile mills which were transformed into the uh, largest kind of retail um, areas in, in Mumbai. So projects like this not only increased Mumbai's open land area, but they more importantly increased the potential for commercial activity and connectivity to the mainland. So now goods were able to come through the mainland versus kind of being set on individual islands, and that spawned a, a whole series of, of um, initiatives in terms of industry and uh, production. But this also had other side effects. It increased the population and migration to cities like Mumbai, and in this large-scale migration, similar to U.S. cities during the same period because of the Industrial Revolution, oil, steel railroads, etc., in the U.S., uh, this presented other problems over the next hundred years of, of development. These two maps um, talk about two different events. The one on the left, um, I would say, is the second event, which kind of... Uh, um, spawns a greater interest in the idea of industry, production, commercial activity, was a more of a global event which had a very local um, uh, um, impact. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 allowed trading routes to shorten, connecting the Red Sea Mediterranean to the Arabian Sea. And Mumbai stood geographically very important within this um, event. The event acted as a catalyst for Mumbai, for the Bombay Port Trust, um, set up by the central government of India, which formed itself around 1870, one year later. This is an important point to note because as the port is not regulated by the state and it's set up by the central government, this has a lot to do with, I think a lot of the issues are going to be discussed here later today, concerning the eastern waterfronts and, and its development. Um, Again, uh, the pointer doesn't work, but if you see the map on the left, um, towards the bottom you'll see a little bit of a blue area on the eastern, on the eastern side of uh, Mumbai. That is the actual eastern waterfronts and the port area. 
Um, that is also considered the, traditionally the, 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 city, the, the old city or the town side, which was formed first, which contained not only the eastern waterfronts, but defense, uh, naval, and I think the points, defense areas in red. Um, all the uh, blue areas are the, are the eastern waterfronts. You'll also see the post-industrial um, 1960 industrial expansions of that onto the right side in the lavender. And uh, in the orange, the suburban and the kind of textile mills and industry. And then everything north of that orange area is basically suburban expansion in the mid 1900s and uh, early, uh, um, uh, late 20th century. Um, so, so the port establishing its first dock in 1880 and growing substantially for a century, it's approximately 150 square miles in area, until massive pressures of overpopulation and other urban pressures forced it to reduce its activity and develop the uh, Navasheva port, or the JNPT, which is across the harbor to the right, which will be just right of the, of the map where the um, black lines are indicated. So now more popularly known as the Eastern Waterfronts, which will be discussed in the panels, the area remained in controversy since the 1970s and claims that the Port Trust no longer requires this area actually for its activities. The Navasheva port and future plans for even larger ports would be better suited to handling commercial cargo and container traffic into India and that this land should come back to the city itself, providing much needed open space, housing, um, diverse commercial activities, which could add tremendous benefit uh, to the existing master plan and the quality of life. Um, then we have the third um, event, which is not really a physical event necessarily, but more of an act um, and regulatory in nature. Uh, which required very little presence in the form of any infrastructure or building within Mumbai, but it does have a very specific, um, uh, something very specifically to do with the idea of port areas and the coastal edge of India. Uh, in 1991, the CRZ, or the Coastal Regulation Zone, was developed by the government of India as a blanket policy to protect India's coastal and marine environments from increasing pressures of urban development, tourism, recreational activities, and resource exploitation. This was defined, defined basically in three categories. Uh, one was the CRZ1, um, which are more ecologically sensitive and important zones like national parks, coral reefs, um, res reserve forests, mangroves, marine parks. Uh, this is indicated in the uh, purple area on the right on the map, which are the sensitive areas. We have CRZ2, which is the, up to 500 meters from the high tide line on the coastlines of Mumbai. These are areas which have already been developed or are close to the shoreline or areas with municipal limits or urban. Okay, and these are areas which have specific guidelines on how they can be further developed. This is indicated in the yellow on the map on the right. And then we have CRZ3, which are areas which are relatively either more rural or undisturbed. And this has a lot to do with um, maybe traditional fishing villages, communities, koliwadas, uh, Gautans that kind of exist on, still exist on the coast and still operate as local villages within the city. Now theoretically this made a lot of sense doing this in the late 1900s and has obviously also saved a lot of what um, we consider in Mumbai as important open spaces and natural resources. But there were many issues with uh, policies, blanket policies like this and I think one is the kind of um, uh, the the a contradiction or the dichotomy that exists between the idea of how does one develop a city or a coastline in a mutually beneficial way, symbiotically, also thinking about things like the environment, um, open spaces, and uh, spaces that are accessible to the public. This has not happened in Mumbai. It's very clear that this has always been a controversy. And uh, it, 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 it does happen, of course, in, in very little spurts, which I'll show in, in one of the maps. Um, but on the broad, on the broad um, uh, if you look at the broad map of Mumbai, I've drawn a yellow line on the left. This shows over 60 uh, kilometers of actually coastline that's available in Mumbai. The map on the right in green shows actually what is technically even just accessible. I'm not talking about great open spaces, I'm talking about just simply accessible to the public. Um, 
And I'll just show you three simple examples. Um, one is South Mumbai. This is where, I think if anyone's been to Bombay, the Taj Hotel uh, is in South Bombay. It's one of the oldest areas and the original settlements. Um, you'll see on the, on the images on the right, um, residential tourism exists there. You'll see on the lower edge, settlements also exist there. And you'll see on the upper area, defense also sits there, all within um, walking distance of each other. The next is, of course, the eastern waterfronts and the docks, which will be discussed later today, the three docks that were created by the Bombay Port Trust, which are still in operation, um, although just for cargo, uh, cargo, not container activity. And the last one, um, the idea that the coastlines don't only exist in the port areas, but obviously through the beaches and natural resources that the city already has, and how to kind of deal with those, which I think some of the panels will also discuss on what has already been done. On the lower right, you'll see an image that shows infrastructure, residential, recreation, and commercial, talking about an airport, hotels, residential, and beaches all existing in one, one uh, specific area. And then the upper area is showing settlements, residential, and of course, just the open spaces themselves. And then uh, maybe just touching quickly on what Mark said in the beginning, which is like, how does the waterfront actually develop the city? And I just show these quick images. We have tourism, we have recreational and public space. We have industry, commercial, government activities. We have the natural resources or the environment and the ecology of the nalas, of the mangroves, of the mudflats. Uh, we have the recreational spaces, the infrastructure, the, the mobility. Um, and then eventually going back to the image I presented in the beginning, is there a new way of thinking not just about open spaces and recreation, but thinking about how all the things that make uh, Mumbai its own dynamic um, city can be reincorporated into kind of a new imagination of the waterfront. Thanks. All right, welcome to Istanbul. We'll uh, move quickly uh, through some slides here. So Istanbul is actually, uh, yeah, with, yeah, anyhow. So without the pointer, it's a little bit tricky, but you'll see, you see the Mediterranean, the Asian Sea, then there's a little inland sea, which is the Marmara and the Black Sea on the, on the top. So Istanbul is in a strategic position to basically connect those uh, three uh, seas together. Uh, here you see it closer, in a close-up uh, Marmara Sea, which is an inland sea, not a lot of International people know about the Marmara Sea, but it's actually quite important to Istanbul. So I, that's why I'm showing it to you. And then here you see a uh, further close-up of the Bosphorus that cuts the city in two, which is the main waterfront in Istanbul. Um, so here you see Istanbul. It's um, basically, uh, we will probably hear these words a lot tonight, today. So it's, uh, yes, Europe and Asia, Marmara Sea. Uh, the Bosphorus is the main strait. Um, it also separates Asia from Europe, and you see the Black Sea and the Golden Horn. Um, this may, shows the central uh, historical cultural her heritage waterfronts uh, in the middle, basically, with the old peninsula. Uh, towards the Marmara coast, this is how the city expanded. You see you have the urban waterfronts, and on the north side, we still have the sort of natural coast. Um, if you're a tourist, this is what you probably see of Istanbul, the glorious history of the city. Um, you can kind of see Pera. If you're a little bit more adventurous, then you end up crossing the Bosphorus and get this view. Um, most of the waterfronts are actually very active transport nodes, so a lot of them actually feel like this. There's buses, there's different kind of boats that come and leave. This is also actually one of the bigger port areas as well on the back. Uh, here you see uh, the largest port. In, in the city right now. Um, th this is looking from Asia back to Europe. You see the central business district in the back. Um, this is a kind of bigger sh image of that. And then, of course, there's the rest of the city, which is this sort of density as well. So the water is, becomes very crucial in creating breathing space within the city. And uh, this is a quick shot of the north coast, which is the natural reserves, or what we call the natural areas. Um, Istanbul is a big city, of, it's, uh, here you see all the big cities and um, bigger than 5 million and um, the ones that are painted in uh, orange are port cities. Um, when we talk about Istanbul, we, the biggest cliche is that it's a city bridging east and west and there is, uh, the tr reality of that cliche is that you cannot talk about Istanbul without talking about the world because you have to talk about the east and the west. Um, 
the countries that are painted in uh, green here are the places where Turkish passports can travel without visa. So you see it's also, I think, this kind of borders and uh, the, the ease of traveling uh, is important to see. Russia has been added very recently, so actually uh, it was not very porous before. And then you will see the flights, the direct flights out of Istanbul, and you will see actually it's very connected to Europe even though the boundaries are quite uh, hard, but it actually does a lot of trade with Europe and a lot of also interaction with the US. Um, it's also in terms of connectivity, it's the world's largest Facebook city or second largest Facebook city, so it's bigger than London, New York, uh, Paris. So it's also important to see, I think, all of these connectivities, I think, of the city because it's actually not a port city. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, here you see the worldwide trade and you see how it actually bypasses Istanbul. Uh, because it's just way... Uh, Istanbul uh, was never the industrial port city that New York was, uh, because it was, though, um, in the 17th century, it was a big port city, but afterwards, towards the end of the Ottoman Empire, it, it didn't become the big industrial city that New York or London became. So it, after that, it never had that kind of working port um, feeling to it. Uh, and it still is actually easier to bypass Istanbul and the Bosphorus to go to the Black Sea. It's better to go um, up to uh, Europe, get to Rotterdam, and then you put things on, ra um, on railroads and it gets to Russia faster than it going through the Bosphorus. So this is, I think, an important point in thinking about Istanbul. It's another map that demonstrates how kind of basically the world container traffic actually bypasses um, Istanbul. Um, a quick map showing the growth of the city. The darker part are, parts are the older parts, the old peninsula where also you have the Byzantine port and etc. And the Golden Horn, which is a very protected water, so it's important to mention. And a bunch of villages up the Bosphorus and the growth of the city you see in this map. It, the city follows a very sort of normal pattern, I will call it, where you have views and access to the water. It's, it's, a, it's richer, it's more educated, and where you don't have views to the back ends, it's a kind of a poorer and less educated and some kind of bigger families, um, etc. Uh, here you see the existing port areas. They're mostly to the south, but they're not to the scale of any of the bigger ports that we will look at today. They're much smaller ports. Um, and some of them are being redeveloped, uh, which two of them we will discuss also today with Galata Port Project. Uh, here you see the uh, bus network in the city. It's important to see this because it's actually a very polycentric city. It doesn't have one center, it actually has many um, sub-centers. And here you see how the, um, the boat traffic happens. These are all the um, small ports that work for, as commuter uh, ports within the city. So even though it's not a big port city, it's very important to say that the waterfront is very important for one, because it's a very dense city and actually water of kind of prepares the breathing areas. It, it uh, makes sure that the city has some room to breathe. Okay, uh, with that, I'll pass it on to Pedro. So hello. Uh, Okay, I will try to give you a small overview on the development of the port over the years and also to bring some, some questions which I think are, are key for our debate uh, later on. This, this image shows, of course, the, the, the global trade and port, port areas are totally related to global trade. Uh, Rio uh, was a colony of Portugal and many commodities have, have passed through its port over the centuries. Unfortunately, today, it's still a lot of commodities where our, our, our economy is pretty much based on commodities. But this very particular slide shows the, the slavery trade uh, over years. And it's, it's pretty impressive, the number of slaves that were brought, that, that were brought to Brazil and the, through the port of Rio. Uh, 900,000 slaves passed through this port. So this is very key to understand both Brazilian culture at large, but also to understand the very nature of this port area. Uh, this is a, let's say the historical map and a satellite image of, of Rio de Janeiro, the Guanabara Bay. Actually, Rio de Janeiro, Rio means river, because when the Portuguese they came to the city, they imagined uh, at first that this was a river, but it's actually this bay. So it's a very particular uh, geography, very well protected waters, both in military terms, and uh, uh, safe waters for navigation. Uh, this image is on the top is the, is the royal family of Portugal. 
the royal family of Portugal came to Brazil in 1808 after Napoleon troops invaded uh, before they invaded Portugal. Uh, this is very important to understand also the history of, of Rio de Janeiro. Rio, uh, in 1763, became the capital of the colony due to the mining economy in land in Minas Gerais state. So uh, before that, it was Salvador. Uh, it was an economy of sugarcane, but with the shift, it came to Rio. And in 1808, uh, it becomes the capital of the Portuguese empire. I think this is the single event in the world where a colony becomes the capital of the empire. And of course, this has a huge impact in the city and it completely transforms because once the, the court is here, the court needs a city that symbolizes the power and that this, I mean, through science, arts, and through urbanism also. So a lot of interventions uh, happen in the city by this time. Uh, in two decades, the, the population of the city doubles from 100,000 people to 200,000 people. At this time, New York is it's more or less double the population of, of Rio. And then in the 60s, the capital is moved again, and then the capital leaves the, the waterfront, the, 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 the city in the water, and goes inland in the country as a strategy of Brazilian government to develop this, this uh, the inland of Brazil. And of course, this also has a huge impact of the city because the city has been the capital of the colony, capital of the Portuguese Empire, capital of the Republic, and, and then it loses uh, its, its centrality. So it's very important to understand uh, real as the, the this capital dimension of real to understand what does the city, what, what does, uh, how this urban space was produced, and what kind of communication this urban space is interested on. Uh, this is uh, the southeast of Brazil. São Paulo, Minas, and, and Rio. Rio is in, in uh, light gray. And, and some of the ports. The port of Rio de Janeiro, which was modernized in 1910. And the port of Itaguaí, which in 1982, that many of those activities after containerization, etc., moved to Itaguaí. But the, the, the port in, the, inside the city is still very important. And Santos. Santos is the largest one. It's connected to São Paulo. These three states together, Minas, Rio, and São Paulo, they have more than 50% of the GDP. So this is the port area of here in red in relation to the municipality, light gray, the metropolitan, uh, uh, urbanized area of the metropolitan area. And, and this image shows the scale of the, of the project which is going on now. And Niterói, that Verena is going to talk, talk later, is here. It's on the other side of the bay, close to the bridge. Uh, it's very important to understand in Rio the, the, the landscape. The landscape is, is much, let's say, spectacular dimension and it's very important when we think of waterfronts how how this landscape affect the waterfronts so this is my bike ride so this is how i enjoy the landscape and and in in red here you have all the landfills uh, built over the years so as you can see i mean the, the whole coastline of rio was transformed so this is uh, one of the first demolition of a hill uh, he was rio had a lot of swamps and hills, and over the years, these, these hills were being demolished and, and landfills being made. This is for the Santos Dumont Airport, demolition of Morro do Castelo. Uh, the, the, the Flamengo Park, it's, uh, it's also a, a landfill. And, and I cannot uh, avoid mentioning Roberto Bulemarx. Roberto Bulemarx was an amazing landscape designer. Uh, he designed the Flamengo Park. Of course, there were more people involved, Afonso Herdado Ridge, Lota Macedo Soares. But, uh, what is amazing about him is that he could make man-made landscapes as beautiful as the natural landscapes of Rio. This is the original map, uh, not the original, this is an old map of the city from 1808. Uh, you can see this is the downtown. On the north is the original coastline of the port area. The, f the, 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 the former port area in the beginning of the colonization was here. This, this is the very beginning of the urbanizing process of the, of the downtown. And in the north, pretty much isolated, you can see the, the, the hills chain. So the port was a little bit isolated from the, the city. So it, it was where all the, the ships come and all the slavery market, etc. So let's say the dirty activities, they were uh, set apart by this chain. And you can see the inlet completely invading the, the middle of the city. So this is the result uh, of, of this area after the landfill. So massive uh, landfill. These are some images of the construction of the port of Rio. This is, was a very special moment. The Brazil became the capital of the Republic in 1889. And in 1902, there was an important mayor in the city called Pereira Passos that he did huge uh, urban intervention. He, 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 uh, 
he, he studied in Paris at the time that Haussmann was, was implementing his urban renewal in Paris, and so he was pretty much inspired. So he built amenities, widened whole roads, and, and at the same time as him, but the, the, let's say the federal government uh, started the, to const the construction of the new port, so modern, modern uh, facilities. So this is where, where the inlet used to go to, to and became channeled. Okay, and in the 50s, uh, in the 60s, starts the decadence of the port area. I mean, the port area was not, let's say, it was always a port area, okay? So let's say it's not in the most uh, uh, amazing place to be. But the, the physical decadence of the place started with the construction of this elevated highway, the Perimetral, which completely uh, transformed the, the, the environment. And this is the central market of the city, cast iron. The perimetral just cut it in the middle and demolished the, the perimetral. And so this is more or less the kind of, uh, of landscape that we had. So we, we are now, uh, he is now facing two mega events, the Olympics and the port area, not events, two major uh, interventions, the Olympics and the port area uh, uh, renewal. So I would like to say that he is in the eye, eye, of, the, is in the eye of the storm. So we do not understand, I mean, we are not going to see Rio as it was. The city is not going to be the city uh, I used to, to grow. And we still don't know exactly what it's going to be. So there is a, a big, uh, let's say, anxiety in society to understand where are we moving forward. So, uh, and these two major events, they, they, they have like two very different approaches. Uh, the, the, the port area is about, is about hermodesting, sprawl, using the, the voids, uh, built infrastructure, etc. And, and the Olympics is pretty much spread on the very west end of the city, so it's about gettification, it's about automobiles. So it's, it's strange that we have these two, let's say, these two heads operating at the same moment. So this is the, on the left is the village for the athletes in Barra da Tijuca, in the far, this kind of uh, 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 investment, and on, on the right, is the judges, now it's changed, I don't know going into that, but urban dance, mixed use, fl ground floor, shop activities, etc. So it's the two things being produced at the same time. And this is the, the area of the, the Porto Maravilha. So I think it's the video now. So I think it, it, I, I like to bring this video because uh, destruction and construction are two sides of the same coin. And Literally, the energy that, that this uh, uh, brings to the... Oh, there is a sound. Come on. It was to be a surprise. Okay. <laughs> no sound. Okay. So we can skip the video. Let's, let's move on. So I think that the, 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 the destruction carries a, a, a very symbolic uh, dimension, which is very important to... to Two minutes, okay. So this is the water fund which is liberating. I think people still don't have idea of the dimension, what it means to have this area of the city completely free and accessible by, by public. This is very important. The waterfront in Rio is all accessible everywhere. So some polemics. There is a big mobility transformation. So the building is a little bit tricky because uh, it operates in a symbolic dimension that it's a choice to, to eliminate the automobile of this landscape, but actually it's being, a tunnel is being digged, so the automobile will go underneath. But we also have investments on, on, the, the, on, on trams, on BRT systems, so that this will totally transform the way we circulate uh, in, in the city. There is, this museum was inaugurated, I think it's pretty interesting because it both, uh, it's both, uh, it's a retrofit of two, two historical buildings with a new roof. But it's also a school, it's a museum and a school, and it's pretty much engaged on the communities around the museum and, uh, and, and the, in the process of transformation. I think it's pretty easy that this museum is playing that role within that. So this is the building potential of the port area. Uh, uh, the, 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 the project of Rio is pretty much interesting in terms of the financial operation that made it possible, but at the same time, the master plan is a very poor master plan, and that's the challenge that, that we have. Uh, density in Copacabana and Porto, very low density. Uh, very few people living, even in total numbers. 
lots of job offers and also the downtown job offers nearby. And if you see the prices of the real estate market over the fast f five past years, Copacabana, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge grow, but in the port is an even more, more huge grow, but it is still much cheaper than other consolidated areas of the city. But then brings the question, what kind of environment is this project producing? And th is this the, the image of the city that we want to produce, or what do we want more mixed use, more social mixed, uh, 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 in a more social mixed environment. So uh, I visited last year for the first time Porto Madeiro. When I was a student in the 90s, Porto Madeiro was the, let's say, there was the paradigm of, of what area rede redevelopment in Latin America. And Porto Madeiro, uh, I realized that Porto Madeiro, although it's a very celebrated project, is detached from the city, but it's detached from the city due to geographical conditions. There is a channel in between, it's a, it's a little bit far. But the Porto Rio has this opportunity. The Porto Rio faces is really surrounded by very lively places. This is Morro da Conceição in the top left. It's a, very, it's a historical, very lively neighborhood. Morro da Providência, after the demolition of the, the other hills. This is the oldest favela in the city. Uh, Moinho Fluminense, amazing industrial landscape. This is a meat, kind of meatpacking uh, in terms of the architecture. And Fabrica da Bering is, a, is an old factory which was occupied. There are 44 art studios, more than 70 entrepreneurs. So, and this is how Studio X is, is trying to work on this. So this was a Clareta Zabos studio on inclusive housing for the port. And this is another study that we, we did a map for a, a, a bike network in the downtown. So we bring this to the city. There is already two kilometers implemented. And this is the carnival uh, in the perimetral, in the demolition of the perimetral. Thank you.